like to welcome all of you at our Creekside service, all of you at our North Udawa campus, um, Bonnie Oaks campus, St. Elmo campus, and all of you worshiping online. I'm Tony Walliser. I'm one of the pastors at Silverdale, and I get the privilege of sharing with you God's Word. So go ahead and take your Bibles, open up to the last chapter of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12. You can also take out your Bible study outlines. They're found in the Silverdale app. You can Pull them up and take, a, take notes and follow along. This is our final message in our series in the book of Daniel. And next week we're beginning a really encouraging sermon series. It's called The Invitation. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the five times that Jesus invites us to come to him and the promises that he makes to us. It's just going to be incredibly encouraging for you, and you do not want to miss the new series called The Invitation. But today, we're finishing our series through the book of Daniel. It's been an amazing study. And in fact, what's blown me away is that, like, you know, this book was written 2,500 years ago, and yet it seems like it was written for people going through a pandemic, right? I mean, it's just been so applicable to what we've been going through. I mean, think about what we've endured. I mean, you know, a lot of things were canceled in our life, right? I mean, you know, okay, all right, well, that dinner date had to be canceled, or that vacation had to be canceled, or that trip had to be canceled, or the ball season had to be canceled, and all those cancelizations, you know, we even had to cancel attending church for a season of time. But then all those things were replaced with what? Just bad news. Replaced with stressful things and anxious things. We, we lost some freedom. We lost our jobs. We lost some income. Lost some relationships. Some folks have lost their lives. And so we've got a lot of bad news in this season of time that we've gone through. But I want to today give you some good news. <laughs> Because the way that Daniel ends is really with a whole lot of bad news, okay? Golly, I mean, he's going to be talking about the end times and the tribulation, the Antichrist, and that's sort of what chapter 11, chapter 12 is a lot about. But in the midst of all this really bad news, God gives him four things that are incredibly encouraging. Because this is what I've discovered. There's a lot of times that we go through trials in life, and we ask God the why question, why, 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 and God often does not answer that question. In fact, that's sort of what Daniel does. In fact, look at Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 8. Daniel asked a question, okay? I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? He, the angel, replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. So Daniel asked a question, and God says, you know what? I'm not going to give you that answer. And that's the way it many times is. There's a lot of times in our life that God doesn't give us the answer what we're looking for. God, if you could just tell me how this is going to end, if you could just tell me how this is all going to work out, then I'd be okay. And God says, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you the answer to those questions, but what I am going to do is I'm going to give you these promises to hold on to. And so what God does is God will give you these promises, these principles that you can hold on to in the middle of difficult times and they're going to give you hope. And so that's why I've entitled this final message is how do you stand to the end? These four promises will help you stand to the end no matter what we encounter in this life. This is important. So I want you to jot it down. The first promise is this, that God rescues those in distress. God promises to rescue those in distress. We go, hallelujah, why? Because we live in a world of distress right now and God promises to deliver us. Look at it. It's found in verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. You go, what's he talking about? He's talking about the end times. These are the final years of human history. It's the great tribulation. What's going to happen? There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations until then. You think things are bad? The Bible predicts things are going to get worse before they get better, okay? A lot of bad news there. Here's the good news. Look at the rest of verse 1. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Hallelujah. The circle in your Bible, circle, will be delivered. God's people will be delivered. If you're on Team Jesus, you're going to be victor. You go, Michael the archangel, what is that all about? Well, Michael the archangel, he is sort of the protector of God's people. And it's the same way. God protects his people. I, I shared this last week with you, that God assigns an angel to every child of God. For what? For protection. Now, ultimately, since this is dealing with the last days, what he's referring to here is the rapture. 
We believe, based on the New Testament, that God in the end times, well, before he pours out his wrath on humanity, God raptures his people away, okay? Now, there's a lot of debate of when that happens, a pre-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture, post-trib, you know, a lot of debate on that. But the problem, the, the reality is that God really does deliver his people. But it's not just in the end times. I believe that God rescues us all the time. In fact, read Psalm 91. In fact, Psalm 91, I pray Psalm 91 every week for myself, for my family, for our church. It's a, it's, a, it's a psalm of deliverance. And so I believe that God delivers his people. And you go, in what way? Well, a number of ways. I mean, some, sometimes God delivers you around, right? You're, you're looking forward, and then suddenly you got this trial coming your way, and you go, oh my goodness, this is going to devastate me. And then suddenly God, whoop, pushes you aside, and it goes right past you, and you go, oh, thank you, Jesus, Right? Sometimes God delivers you around. Sometimes God delivers you through, right? That God's got to take you to the other side. I mean, just like you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right? Jesus had to go through the cross. He wasn't, you know, around it. And sometimes God will have to take us through the suffering, the difficult times in life. But here's the promise of God. That if God is going to take you through, he's going to be with you and he's going to sustain you. That even if you're walking through it, you are still going to be delivered from it, okay? And so that's the final way. Sometimes, okay, around, sometimes through. But then sometimes God literally takes us away, delivers us from it. That's what the rapture is. Literally, boop, snatches us away. We're, we're pulled away, okay? And, and so God does that. And that's what we think. Okay, that's what I want all the time. If God could just snatch me away every time a trial's coming, that would be amazing, right? Well, here's the thing. Most of the time in the Bible that God delivers you from it is through death. You go, what? That's not a good option. That's the worst option. No, not from God's perspective. In fact, in Psalm 116, the Bible says this. God says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God sees death as a homecoming of his children. We see like it's the end, but God says, no, that's sometimes the way I deliver people from trauma. See, God sees your future, and he's like, okay, this is gonna be traumatic, so I'm gonna deliver them from that, through death. I mean, many times when I see the death of a child, that's exactly how I see it. It's like sovereign God knew what was happening and going to happen in that child's future. God protected them from all that hurt by how through death. And so, you know, not a lot of things that you can count on this life right now, right? I'm okay, can we count on sports? When are we going to start school? When it, when's the pandemic going to be over? Can I plan that trip? Can't put many things on your calendar right now. Put this on your calendar. God rescues. God delivers. In fact, turn to the person next to you and just say, God delivers. God delivers. But here's the deal. This is conditional. Can I just tell you God does not deliver everybody? He doesn't. Everybody in this world does not get delivered by God. They don't. Who gets delivered? The children of God. Look again how this is written, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Everyone whose name is found written in the book will be delivered. See, your name has got to be found in the book of life. I mean, just like you have a party and you got a guest of people that are invited to that party and you can't enter that party unless you're on the guest list, right? Well, God's planning an eternal party in heaven. But you got to be on the guest list. Is your name in the book? You see, your name could be in the book of who's who. Your name could be in the book of who's not, right? Your name could be in a membership list of this club or this organization or even the membership list of Silverdale Baptist Church. But what is most important is, is your name in the book of life? Jesus said this about it in Luke 10. He says, do not rejoice in this, that spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in the book in heaven. In the book of Revelation, at the very end, where we see a scene of those that are allowed into God's presence and in heaven. Look at how it's described in Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. Nothing impure will enter it, that's heaven, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name in the book of life? Now you may go, well, how do you get your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Well, that, that little phrase there, the Lamb's book of life, is an important clue. You see, God Almighty, his son is Jesus Christ. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, as the perfect, blameless lamb. See, Jesus lived the perfect life that none of us could ever live. And then Jesus died the death that we all deserve to die. He died on the cross in our place for our sin and to prove it, God raised him up again. 
And now the Bible says that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, at the moment that you say, I surrender all to you, Jesus, I will follow you, Jesus, at that moment of surrender, the Bible says God forgives you, God adopts you as his child, and then God writes your name down in a book, and you are then invited into heaven. And so God gives a promise, hallelujah, in the difficulties, trials of life, God will deliver. But it's conditional, is your name in the book of life, right? But then there's a second promise that God gives Daniel during this time. Jot this on your outline. Number two is this, God resurrects the dead. God resurrects the dead. God raises people up from the dead. And so here's Daniel, he's near near the end of his life, and so God gives him a little glimpse of the resurrection. Check it out, look what it says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. It says, multitudes will sleep in the dust of the earth, will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. You go, what is that? That's the eternal state. Can I just tell you something? Everybody's going to live somewhere, okay? Right? I mean, everybody, we all die, and all of us are going to live eternally somewhere, the eternal state, heaven or hell. Jesus puts it like this. In John chapter 5, verse 28, Jesus says this, For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. See, this answers the question that everybody has. They're like, okay, what happens whenever we die? Well, historically, Christianity has answered it, you know, just like Jesus did. Okay, there's this coming judgment, resurrection of life, resurrection of judgment, okay? So which one are you in? But let me just share with you the alternatives, okay? Here are the false beliefs of what happens when you die. A popular belief in the world is this one. I've put it on your outline, atheistic materialism. Atheistic materialism, what is that? Well, that's basically they believe that you have a body, but you don't have a soul, right? You're a physical being, but you're not a spiritual being. So therefore, when you die, that's it. You just become worm food, right? And so this life has absolutely no purpose to it. There is no hope on the other side of the grave. This is it, right? So just, let's just eat, drink, and party because tomorrow we're going to die, right? And that's basically what they do. And that's how a lot of the world lives, just atheistic materialism. Obviously, the, the Bible contradicts that. Another false teaching is what's known as universalism. And universalism basically says, hey, you know what? You're a spiritual being, and so when you die, you're going to be in God's presence again forever and forever and forever. And basically, you know, everybody's going to get in. Unless you're just a really evil person like Hitler, basically everybody's going to heaven. In fact, you can see this many times at funerals, right? I mean, you know, pastors were notorious for preaching bad people into heaven, right? And and so, you know, you, you hear that and you go, wow, if Uncle John's going in... Man, I, and we're, just, we're all getting in, right? Because we say, well, they're in a better place now. They're in a better place. No, they're not. We're, we're lying to people. I really believe that's part of the reason why people no longer seek after God because they don't think they need to anymore. You know, everybody's going to heaven. It's all, everybody's going to end up there, right? That's universalism. That's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, no, some have eternal life, some have eternal judgment. Another false belief is what's known as reincarnation, and that's what the, um, the Eastern religions believe. That believe. They believe that, okay, when you die, you reincarnate in another shape, another form, and basically in your new life, you're paying for the karma of your last life, and you'll continue in that cycle over and over, thousands of lifetimes, until you eventually, hopefully, will reach nirvana. But the Bible says that's not true either. The Bible says it's appointed for you to die once, and then after that comes the judgment. So we're all going to spend eternity somewhere, Right? Heaven or hell? Now, the Bible in the book of Revelation describes hell as the second death. Did you know that there's two deaths? There's the first death, which is physical death that we will all experience. We're all going to die one day, right? But then there's the second death. What's that? That's eternal spiritual death in a place called hell. But just like there's two deaths, there's also two births. We're all born physically, right? But Jesus says that you can be born again spiritually, That at the moment that you surrender to Jesus Christ, Spirit of God comes to live inside of you. He changes you from the inside out. You have a new spirit in Jesus Christ. And then what happens? Well, good news. If you've been born twice, you only die once. Right? Think of it. We're all going to die once. If you've been born once, you die twice. If you've been born twice, you only face the first death. You do not face the second death, which is eternal destruction. And so my question is, have you been born again? See, the worst thing is not dying. The worst thing is dying without Jesus Christ. 
And so here is the angel encouraging Daniel in the midst of a terrible situation. Hey, let me encourage you. Guess what? God's going to rescue his children. And secondly, there's a resurrection of the dead. But there's a third thing that should encourage us. And it's this. Jot this down. God controls the future. God controls the future. Now, this has been a continuous theme throughout the book of Daniel. Early on, Daniel said, God is the one who raises up kings and puts down kingdoms, right? And God's in control of who wins the election this November. God's in control of that. And then, we, throughout the book of Daniel, we've seen these prophecies. And what is that? That's predictions of the future. So what does that mean? God knows the future? Yes, of course he does. And we've seen that over and over again. In fact, in the last chapter, we didn't study it, but there's 135 details and predictions in chapter 11. Most of them already come true. See, I I challenge you. The Bible is the only book where you can see prophecy historically fulfilled. Only book in all of human history that does it. Why? Because this is no ordinary book. This is a divine book. This is the word of God. And so God predicts the future. And because we know God predicts the future, that means he controls the future, right? Look, look at how this is again written in verse 4. Verse 4, you get all these predictions, but then what happens? But you, Daniel, look at it, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. You go, what does that mean, roll up, seal the, the scroll? Well, back in that day, when they would have documents, a legal document, what they would do, okay, they would be certified, it'd be signed, and then be rolled up tight, and then it would be sealed. That means it would be held tight where you could not undo it. Well, that's what God says, look, here's your future. It is rolled up, it is, it is sealed, it is signed, sealed, delivered. What does that mean? When God sees a future, God doesn't see it as open, God doesn't see it as, you know, uncertain or ambiguous. No, God sees it as closed, as certain, as sealed. It's like this. During the pandemic, ESPN, the sports channel, they weren't able to play any new games, televise any new games. Why? Because there was no games being played. I mean, until this past week, there were no new games. And so what did they do? They played old reruns of classic games. And so I watched a few I rewatched the um, the national championship between LSU and you know Clemson, and in the first you know quarter, Clemson's winning. You go, oh oh my goodness, are they going to win? No, because I already knew, I already saw the game. I knew they're going to get the rear ends beat by LSU. Okay, I mean, so there was no stress, there was no drama, there was no uncertainty because I already knew the outcome. That's the way it is with God. God looks the future as though it's a game already played. It is rolled up. It is sealed. It is secure. You ain't changing it, okay? God controls the future. Now, we as humans, we want to control the future, don't we? Right? Look at how the rest of verse 4 describes humanity. This is really fascinating to me. He says, seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Now, he's going to talk about humanity. Many will go here and there to increase knowledge. Two characteristics of people in the end times is that their ability to travel here and there and their increase of knowledge, a knowledge explosion. Sir Isaac Newton is um, called the father of modern physics. He was a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. He was studying Daniel chapter 12, read verse 4, and he proposed, you know what? I believe that mankind in the future is going to travel from country to country in unprecedented manner. He said, they might exceed 50 miles an hour, (laughs) right? In fact, the atheist Voltaire in France, read Isaac Newton's words and said this. He scoffed. He said, see what a fool Christianity makes of an otherwise brilliant man. But see, what did he do? He believed the word of God, and it has been, we've exceeded 50 miles an hour. Think about it. In the last 150 years, all these prophecies have already come true. I mean, well, you have the arrival of the train, and then the automobile, and then you have the jet, and now we have rocket ships. We, we go from here to there pretty quickly. That's what Daniel predicted. But not only that, an increase of knowledge, right? I mean, when I was in college, I bought a set of encyclopedias. They weighed 70 pounds. They took up two shelves on my bookcase, right? I mean, I could fit 1,000 in a little zip drive today, right? I mean, knowledge is increased. I mean, think about it. you got more knowledge and capability on your phone than the scientists did that put a man on the moon. It's crazy, the, the technology. I mean, in business, one of the most dreaded words is, oh, the Internet's out, right? Because everything shuts down. See, knowledge is 
increased exponentially as time's gone on. Did you know that from the time of Christ to the time the 1700s, knowledge and information only doubled once? 1,700 years. But then information and knowledge doubled again by 1900. That's just 200 years. It doubled again in 50 years, 1950. In 1970, 20 years later, it had doubled again. 15 years ago, they were saying that knowledge is doubling every two years. Today, they say that information and knowledge is doubling every 12 hours. And yet with all our information, all our knowledge, all our capability, can we predict the future? No, we cannot. Nobody can even tell you where the hurricane is going to exactly go. Can anybody tell you, hey, when is this pandemic going to be over? When's the virus going to be cured? When are we able to go back to normal? Are we ever able to go back to normal? I mean, is the economy going to ever turn back? I mean, we do not control the future, but we worship a God who is in control of the future. Look again how it's described. Verse 8, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? I mean, you know, as we study the book of Daniel, I've had a lot of people say, I don't understand. Good news. Daniel didn't understand it all, and he's the one that wrote it, right? And so what does it say? Daniel, God's got it. Just go on, live your life, trust God. He's in control of the future. Verse 9, he replied, go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. There it is again, sealed up. We look to the future, God controls the future. To God, your future is closed, certain, sealed. The Bible says that God has written in his book all the days of yours before there was even one. I mean, God knows. God knows what's the future, the economy, and your life, and your job, and your, your family. God knows when you're going to die, how you're going to die. Do not worry about the future. Just trust in a God who has your future. That's what we're called to do. Now, what's real interesting here is that in the next verse, verse 10, there's further predictions about what the end time is going to be like. Look at what it says in verse 10. Many will be purified and made spotless and refined. Can I tell you that's what keeps me going as a pastor? Because the Bible predicts that in the end times, even when things are going worse, there's going to be an end times revival. That many in the end times are going to be coming to faith. They're going to be cleansed. Many are going to be, you know, purified. You go, what does that mean? Well, that's salvation. See, we are dirty and we need to be washed. We are sinners and we need to be forgiven. And whenever you come to Christ, good news, you're clean. <laughs> you're clean. There's many times in my life that I'm overwhelmed with myself and my sin, and it's like God just puts his hand on me and says, Tony, you're clean. You're forgiven. Man, those are great words to hear, isn't it? Look at how the Bible puts this in Colossians 1.22. But now he, that's Christ, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you. Look at it. Look at how you're described. Holy, unblemished, and blameless in his presence. You go, me? Yes, you, because you are clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know what? There's going to be, according to this passage and other passages, this end time revival where God's going to be reaching a lot of people for Christ. But guess what? While that's going on, there's also to be this end time wickedness. Look at what it says in verse 10. But the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And so what do you have? You have these two things going on. The end times, you know, people are going to become more and more dark and wicked, and then it's going to increase more and more. But you're going to have also, this, oh, on this side, you've got people falling in love with Jesus. And you know, in America, we've had what's known as cultural Christianity. And so there's a lot of people that sort of lived sort of Christian, even though they weren't really followers of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, that's going away in the future. You see, what it's going to be, it's going to be either you're a passionate lover of Jesus Christ or you hate God and his word. It's not going to be any middle ground anymore. So you're going to have to choose. Who am I going to follow, this world or Jesus Christ? Both are going to exist. And folks, can I tell you something? That's where we're headed today. That's where we're at. And that was all predicted. Hey, Many are going to be cleansed, but you know what? The wicked are going to continue to do their wicked. And so, look, we have difficult times. God promises, of, look, I promise to rescue you. I promise the resurrection. I promise that I'm in control. But there's one final promise God wants to give you, and it's this. Jot this down. God rewards your faithfulness. God rewards your faithfulness. You can't control the future, but you know what? You can't control your conduct. You can say, God, I want to choose to be faithful. Now, here's Daniel. He's probably 90 years old by now. His life is near the end, and God encourages him. Well, you know what? I'm going to reward you, Daniel. Check it out. Verse 13. 
As for you, Daniel, go your way to the end. That means just keep doing what you've been doing, Daniel. You will rest. That means you're going to die. And then at the end of days you will rise, that's the resurrection, to receive your allotted inheritance. You go, allotted inheritance, what is that? That is your eternal rewards. You know what amazes me about Daniel is that Daniel never sought to be famous, and yet he was famous. His contemporary, Ezekiel, describes Daniel as one of the most, you know, well-known men in all of human history. Jesus himself quotes Daniel. Daniel is famous, and yet Daniel never wanted to be famous. Daniel just wanted to be faithful. Now contrast that to our world today. Everybody wants to be famous, right? Everybody wants to be an online influencer. I need followers and clicks and likes. Don't worry about being famous. Just worry about being faithful, and then God will take care of you. That's all God wants to do. God promises to reward you. In this life, yes, but ultimately in eternal life. See, not all, all of Daniel's rewards were experienced in this life. Jesus put it like this. Jesus said, don't just store up treasures on earth, but store up treasures in heaven. See, why? Because they're secure there. I mean, think about it. A lot of people lost a lot of money in the stock market this year. God says, hey, if you'll trust me, I'll take care of you. It's secure. Did you know that God rewards us for every act of faithfulness? Jesus said, you give a cup of water in Jesus' name. There's an eternal reward for that. Think of that. That's amazing. So what is it? God sees you. God sees you. Every time you say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit, God says, there's a reward for that. You know, every time that you give to the kingdom cause of God, there's a reward for that. Every time that you share your faith, there's a reward for that. Every time you die to yourself and you love your spouse and you love your children or love your neighbor, there's a reward for that. God sees every act of faithfulness in your life and God rewards you for it. You will be rewarded. Man, that's good news. Let me show you what the New Testament says about this. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes about the day that we stand before Christ. It's the judgment seat of Christ, and it's not the judgment of whether you're going to heaven or hell. It's the judgment of how many rewards we will get in heaven. Notice how the Apostle Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 13, he says this, Each one's work will become manifest for the day, the day of judgment will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation, which is Christ, survives, he will receive what? A reward. God promises to reward you. God sees you. God sees your life. God sees you when nobody else is faithful and you are faithful. God says, I see you and I will reward you. God will reward you. Now look, I know we're in a hard season in life. The Bible says it's going to get harder. But God promises that no matter what trials are coming in life, he may not answer your questions why or what, but he will say this. This is what you got to hang on to. Remember, here's the promise. God says, I will rescue you. Trust me. (laughs) There is a resurrection from the dead. And not only that, I'm in control of your future. But finally, I see you in all your struggles, and I do reward your faithfulness. And if you will hang on to those four truths that was given to Daniel here, you can stand until the end. Amen? Amen. 